So starting out with stellar remnants, um, just to get your brain working this morning, um, what are the lowest mass stellar remnants that are left behind by dying stars? All right, I'm seeing most votes for brown dwarfs, which is not really true because they were never stars to begin with. So the brown dwarf star was, if you have a um, piece of collapsing molecular cloud and it's less than 0.8 solar masses, it won't um, ever be able to reach the temperatures and pressures needed to spark fusion in its core. So brown dwarfs are not stellar remnants, they're kind of, they're failed stars. So white dwarfs are actually the uh, lowest mass remnants that we have followed by neutron stars and then black holes. So we'll talk about all, well, we'll talk about white dwarfs and neutron stars today. And then next time we'll go into more detail on neutron stars and black holes. All right, so in general, the fates of stars depends on their initial mass. So for a star between 0.8 and 10 times the mass of our sun in initial mass, it will leave behind a white dwarf um, with a mass range between 0.8 and 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Um, whereas if you have a heavier star, so 10 to 40 solar masses, that'll leave behind a neutron star and anything more massive than that will leave behind a black hole. And this isn't really the end of the line for stars. Um, the remnants can actually interact with each other too. So for example, in binary systems, the white dwarfs can merge together or you can have neutron star mergers, black hole mergers, um, or kind of combinations of those things. So to, next time we'll talk about some of the um, cool supernovae that can happen uh, due to those interactions. All right, so how do these um, low mass stars die and why do they leave behind a white dwarf? And you know, what is a white dwarf? Why is it special? So when we have our low mass star, we know that it takes this kind of winding evolutionary track along the HR diagram where it goes through two phases of expansion, the subgiant and the giant phase, before experiencing the helium flash, falling down, burning stably in the horizontal branch for a while until it ascends again, another asymptotic giant branch. And then at this point, um, once it has gianted as much as it will, some of that um, mass is flung off into space in the form of a planetary nebula, and the rest of it becomes the white dwarf star. So the rest of this track, this um, planetary nebula curve, um, is the exposed inner core of the star on its way to becoming a white dwarf. So something happened inside the star to trigger this evolution. And we know that the you know, first stage of evolution was triggered by the loss of hydrogen fuel in the core. Um, and you can burn heavier and heavier elements depending on your mass. So if you have a low mass star, less than two times that of the sun, what is the heaviest element that they can produce in their course? Okay, I'm seeing most votes for my decoy answer here. The decoy answer was iron, but low mass stars cannot produce iron by fusion. Um, they only have enough mass to squeeze their cores to the temperature and pressure that's high enough to fuse oxygen. So remember, this was the product of the CNO cycle that we did in the last activity. And so for stars that are less than two solar masses, they are capable of fusing all of these things, but no farther. So these stars are unable to fuse oxygen. So um, what happens as this happens? So, you know, some oxygen ash is going to build up in the core and what changes will that drive? Okay, so I'm now seeing most votes for B, that the pressure decreases and this causes the core to contract. Um, can I get any volunteer to um, explain your reasoning for why you would have chosen that in particular? Yep, exactly. So coming back to that idea of hydrostatic equilibrium, the balance between internal pressure and gravity pressing down from the outer layers. Um, when we uh, build up too much oxygen, then the star can't fuse the oxygen. So the pressure drops because the fusion rate drops. And so um, if they were able to squeeze down to a temperature and pressure that could ignite the oxygen, then they could continue burning and they would keep burning more and more you know, shells of heavier and heavier elements. Um, but low mass stars can't do that. And so the gravity beats pressure and contracts that core. So this has happened to our star before, right? This happened um, during each of the giant steps before, 
but this time it's really a problem because it will fail to ignite a new round of fusion. And so the white dwarf star is going to be the result of this core contracting to ever and ever smaller sizes. Um, a white dwarf star is just that core of the star. So it has around the same mass as the star itself, you know, order of magnitude, um, but it's the size of a planet or smaller. So here is a typical white dwarf star in relation to the size of the earth. Um, they have a mass limit. So they have to be below 1.4 times the mass of the sun. And this is what separates whether a stellar remnant will become a white dwarf star or a neutron star. So if it's a little bit more than 1.4 solar masses, it will become a neutron star instead. Um, the white dwarf star is filled with a weird type of matter that we have not encountered before called degenerate matter. And so essentially the idea is that now instead of the pressure inside the star um, coming from nuclear fusion, from the radiation generated by fusion, instead now gravity is going to be balanced by something called degeneracy pressure. And that's just the pressure of the um, degenerate electron gas. So what does it mean to have a degenerate electron gas? Um, basically electrons, they can um, be in the same energy level. So they can have the same position um, and energy, but this only works if their spins are opposite each other. So they have a kind of a spin associated with their rotation. If electrons have opposite spin, they can live in the same energy level. Um, but you can't have any more than those two. One spin up, one spin down, that's it. Um, that's like full package of electron in a given energy state. If you try to add more, they just won't squeeze together. So they just resist being squeezed any further together. Um, and the, the idea that they can only sit together when they have opposite spins, that's called the Pauli exclusion principle, and it's a quantum effect. Um, so really all the matter in a white dwarf star is essentially a quantum material. Um, okay, so it just can't be described by our normal rules of chemistry. In other words, you have to use quantum physics to describe um, the pressure of that gas. So it ends up to be very high. You can reach a very high pressure um, with electron degeneracy pressure. And so it can withstand quite a bit of force, but not an infinite amount of force from gravity. Okay. And then within this neutron, uh, sorry, white dwarf star, the electrons can still move around a little bit. So before the electrons could move freely within the interior of the star, but now in the very packed white dwarf, they can only move if one of the other electrons gets out of the way. So it's kind of like a really crowded parking lot where they can play a game of musical chairs, but they can't move in a considerable way. So white dwarfs are very, very compact, um, crowded objects. So um, what happens, do you suppose, if we add more or less mass to a white dwarf star? We said that they um, come in different masses between 0.8 and 1.4 solar masses. So how do you suppose their mass relates to their size? Yes, the answer is A. Maybe you expected to be surprised here, or maybe you remember from the reading. The more massive a white dwarf star, the smaller it is. So more mass means more gravity to press in, and that will actually contract the star, but only to a certain um, size. So eventually, the electrons are free to move around a little bit, but if you make the parking lot more crowded, right, then the electrons will not be able to move around anymore. They'll be at their maximum amount of packed togetherness and they'll produce the maximum amount of um, degeneracy pressure. All right, so it's strange, but smaller dwarfs are actually the more massive uh, remnants. Um, another difference between white dwarfs of different masses is their composition. And this is just because they come from a range of massive stars and that different range of masses produces different amounts of gravity that can spark different uh, fusion cycles. So if you have a more massive star, you're more likely to have that CNO cycle go on for longer. And you may even produce some neon and some magnesium um, as some of those byproducts are uh, fused with, with other elements inside the star. So since the more massive stars um, can produce those different elements, then they end up with a higher fraction of uh, heavier elements in the white dwarf. So the, the atomic nuclei, the you know clumps of protons and neutrons, those are still basically intact inside the white dwarf star. 
it's only the electrons that are experiencing this bizarre degeneracy physics. Um, for middle sized, white, um, I guess initial mass, low mass stars, they produce a carbon oxygen white dwarf. And then the lowest mass stars produce a white dwarf that's mostly made of helium with maybe a little bit of, um, of carbon. And now looking at the white dwarf on the HR diagram, I um, want to talk about why it makes this kind of weird arc shape. And it's, oh, I meant to kind of label points on the graph here, but up here, this would be point A, um, the last time our star went giant. And since some of the mass is flung off, it exposes the inner core. And so then as that inner core um, collapses, then it arcs out this, um, kind of in this direction at a relatively constant luminosity, but increasing in temperature as the uh, core contracts. And then eventually the white dwarf will, you know, be a white dwarf. It will have electron degeneracy pressure within and over time it will cool and dim. And most of the white dwarfs that we measure are in a single range in the HR diagram. Um, there is a minimum amount of luminosity that they still have. So they're still glowing and they have a black body spectrum in the visible range. It peaks in the visible range. So they're still producing radiation, not due to nuclear fusion, but just because they're still hot. Okay, so the very coolest white dwarf is 3900 Kelvin. Why do you suppose there are no cooler white dwarfs? All right, so there's a few answers here that we can rule out essentially. Yep, there's no fusion happening, so we can get rid of B. Right, so it's like maybe this is possible, but we don't really know for sure. And they might not have nearby massive stars with, that are emitting UV radiation. Some of the other things we can get rid of are oxygen on the surface. Not all the white dwarf stars contain oxygen at all. So even if it was possible that that insulated them, it wouldn't necessarily apply to all of them. And then they don't really have a corona. They've lost already their um, stellar atmospheres. And so we, we can also throw out the warmed by coronal gas idea. So what we're left with then is basically the universe is not old enough for any of the white dwarf stars to have cooled beyond this point. So the cooler a white dwarf star, the older it must be. So basically, if I wanted to show you, let's see, the eventual path of the white dwarf, it'll continue getting lower in temperature and lower in luminosity over time like this. And so it's black body radiation curve, if I was going to sketch that, would start out somewhere in the visible range. Uh, and then over time, it would shift over to the infrared farther and farther um, toward longer and longer wavelengths until eventually that curve just became flat. So then it's going to continue to hold all the, you know, atomic nuclei and um, electrons that were in there initially. It's just going to have lower and lower temperatures and it basically solidifies into a solid crystal. And so since some white dwarfs are carbon and oxygen, then, you know, a crystal of carbon is a diamond. So they're basically in the long, long future of the universe going to be just giant floating diamonds in space. <laughs>